Welcome to Business with Beers, a podcast for business owners who want to scale their business to massively grow their income and contribution by investing in people, process, and technology. I am your host, Brian Beers. This week, we've got Joe McCabe from Philadelphia. Joe is an entrepreneur involved in a lot of different businesses that include real estate brokerage, title, mortgage company, a home health care company, and he owns a bunch of rental properties too. In this episode, we talk about growing through acquisition, utilizing a roll-up strategy in which he acquires underperforming businesses, he cuts out the fat from the P&Ls, and then he integrates them into his existing operations. Joe talks about the benefits of running lean to maximize profitability. And listen to the end where Joe shares some great advice on how he empowers and motivates his people that run his locations throughout the country. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, welcome. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, this wouldn't be business with beers if I didn't ask you. We were at a bar having some drinks. What are we drinking? Oh, man. I hope we're in the Northeast because uh, you might look at, you might judge me for a second because it's going to be Twisted Tea Lights. Okay. And if you make me drink a beer, I'm going to drink Yards. Twisted I like the standard lights. Pal Al. Okay. Yep. Philadelphia, Philadelphia Company, right? Yep. Uh, awesome. So for those who don't know, uh, please share your story, who you are, what you do. Um, take it from there. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I, uh, am from Philadelphia my entire life. Um, born and raised, went to college locally. Um, I went to Penn state for two years, uh, joined the army after that. I was a, a military police investigator and, um, got out of my reserve time. Uh, well, the, you know, that initial training section went to graduated from Cabrini locally and immediately got into real estate. Um, so started selling real estate for Keller Williams, um, out in Langhorn PA. And then I kind of got into, um, I wanted to own my own shop. I wanted a title. I wanted that mortgage. I, I kind of knew that they all blended together mm-hmm. and I wanted a piece of it. So I went to the only franchise I, I could afford and that would talk to me at the time. And that was Remax. So we now have five Remaxes, 200 agents. Um, and ironically we're now setting up, uh, I've taken a step back from that but we're setting up title companies within many of the Keller Williams offices around, around the area. So some of the largest ones around, uh, and then, um, this year alone has been a unique year for, for our business because we were able to make a lot of acquisitions to get us to that five office, 200 agent mark, but we've managed to get into the home care business at a scale of, um, roughly 15 million in gross revenue, uh, which is really big in home care because your multiples are done based on your gross. Okay. Um, so that's, that's been great. Uh, acquired a few other title companies, set up a few additional ventures, um, got my pilot's license. So, so it's been an exciting year while everyone else is kind of, uh, hiding away, not doing much. And I guess following the law, uh, we were, <laughs> we were just, you were busy tra- out there making deals. Forward. Yeah. We didn't have a choice. So, uh, so with, with all these things, where, where do you focus your time? Like, what do you see your primary role? Uh, I mean, I think you're the visionary, right? Uh, yeah. In the yeah. I, I, um, I've got a weird, like weird role. I like to set up the operation, which isn't normal. Like I actually enjoy the operation side of things. Okay. Um, I like to get things running hands off and then delegate everything that I set up off to somebody else so that at any point I can jump into any company, any role and pretty much help out. I got the hang of it. I know what went wrong. I know where the breakdowns were. Um, we've revamped our title company that year that took about three months to do. Uh, we had to cause a lot of turmoil to do it, but it had to be done. So I actually enjoy setting up those operations and then taking a step back and, and putting the key players in place to, to run them from there. So do you launch them with that key person in place or are you the guy getting it going and then you go out and find that person who can then replace um, you? It depends on the situation. So a lot of times, like a lot of times in the acquisitions, uh, especially on the real estate side, you know, we're looking at a P and L that's pretty fat. You know, a lot of owners are wor- living out of their business, working out of their businesses. There's a lot of ad backs. So that's good for us from a buying standpoint. And then we're, we're, our systems are in place for the most part. So then I go into their company, wipe out their systems, put ours into place. And usually uh, a big step for me this year was hiring a general manager for Remax, so someone that actually oversees the day to day and the recruiting, because obviously running around setting up home care companies and title companies, I can't also recruit, train, retain all that other stuff that you have sure. to do. Um, so I found someone to kind of help be the stable piece of Remax this year. So okay. I try to find them. You know, we're constantly recruiting. 
looking for additional staff on our, our mortgage front now. Um, the same thing. So, you know, I have an operations guy. He's awesome. He's awesome from a sales perspective, but I also need someone that's just out there beating the pavement daily recruiting yeah. uh, for loan officers. So then you've got, so is the title and the mortgage within that Remax branch? Or are they all kind of separate entities and so, they operate in their own divisions? Yeah, so that's a, that's a unique aspect. I mean, you won't find a lot of real estate brokers that have a scalable title company. They normally just service their own real estate brokerage. Mm-hmm. I always looked at everything in its own pool. So yes, our title company services Remax and it, the, the mortgage company services Remax. But we also have ventures as far out as California for title and mortgage. Uh, where we service other real estate companies. So I've always looked at everything in its own bucket. You know, can I, um, I guess I like to suffer a little bit. Can I survive off of just the income on mortgage, just the income on title? What if that falls apart? Well, if Remax falls apart and I was only servicing them, I lose everything else. So that's where I was like, you know what? I want it all to be its own standalone company. Um, and so that's when we started getting into other joint ventures with other brokers. Uh, this way, I have, I have full exposure to the market. I get to see it all. And and honestly, um, from a competition standpoint, you know, <laughs> there's so many realtors and so many brokerages. You know, you even look at some of the top agents in Philly, like Mike McCann. Well, I've only done one deal with Mike McCann in seven years in real estate. Uh, so we're really not competing as much as people think. And okay. so we might as well find a way to work together. Do you, are, are a lot of these joint ventures, the title companies, the mortgage? Yeah. Um, yep. So standard setup, you know, we, we maintain majority, we run the full operation. They just, we're just in-house with them and they refer deals in. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So talking about the home healthcare, why, why that, I mean, you've been growing big and title and mortgage and is a diversification. What was the, like, what was the driving factor? So it's there? just, um, really, I think the, the initial attraction, a lot of things fell into place at the same time. So I had just partnered with a guy, um, on a, uh, a bar that we were looking at. We were going to go in on it together. It, it basically the guy was selling this thing for nothing. And so him and I got to talking and I said, well, you know, I have this home care company that reached out to me and they said that they would sell our finance this for six months. I didn't know anything about home care, but the operator was a distant operator. He was just retiring. So he wasn't involved in the day to day. So yeah. in theory, I could lean out the operation and instantly add value. And, um, he said, well, he said, actually, um, my friend, uh, I can't say where he works or his name cause he's still there, sure. but he's the CEO of a local home care company. So we got together. And so we, um, we ended up piecing this deal together, uh, got it seller financed, got it stabilized, uh, increased margins by like 20% just during our stabilization, leaning out the business. And he kind of pitched us on how much, uh, potential there was in the home care world. You know, how many people are aging out, um, especially in the private pay side. So we started buying other companies. So we basically went from Lake Jackson, uh, which was a big care builders franchise. That was like, they did like one and a half million in revenue. I think we're at close to two now. Then we bought Pittsburgh, which was 4.2. We're up to like 4.6. Um, and we just started buying these locations. We did a deal in Chicago. Uh, we're going to start Philly fresh. Uh, we're, you know, a fresh start in Philly. They, they have a smaller franchise here that we're going to buy. Um, but then we'll be building that from the bottom. And now we're looking at independent locations too. And are all these seller financed? What's like for the most part, look uh, like? Yeah, for the most part, they're seller financed. I mean, we'll put down, you know, five, 10%. We'll put them on a five year exit plan, you know, where we'll pay off the loan within five years. Um, usually amortized over 10 years just to give us a little room, four to 5% interest, um, maybe a profit share you know, cause we're selling them on the fact that we're going to lean out the business and we're showing them a, a projection. Um, but seller financing big because anything under 3 million private equity, to, private equity in the home care space is not interested. I mean, honestly, and they want 25 to $50 million businesses. Yep. So we're at 16. Now our goal is to get the 25 to 50 million within, within five years. I think we'll do it in three. And, um, the multiples in home care are pretty ridiculous when you get to those levels. I mean, once you breach the 25 million mark, you could trade for anywhere from like 12 and a half percent or sorry, 12 and a half times to 15 times the net. Okay. Um, that's pretty So good. that's our trajectory. So yeah. 25 and, and million them, in sales and you could get right. a 12 and a half to 15 multiple of earnings. That's yes. Or yep. do you right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, 
in, in are there companies, private equity companies that, that roll up these and make, Oh yeah. Or that's the, that's yeah, that's the their big play. Yeah. That, that business isn't going anywhere. I think over the next 15 years, it's just year over year over year increases, uh, pretty dramatic amounts. So, so all these are remote, right? The ones in mm -hmm. Arizona that the first one, uh, Lake Jackson, Texas, No oh, Texas, okay. Uh, Texas, yeah, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and Chicago, Chicago. So do you have someone in the market that's running this that was in place yeah. a, a manager? Um, yeah. So we've been really lucky that the operations, the owners had already kind of taken a step back. They were all of retirement age. A lot of them were in the medical field prior to owning these. So they kind of were running them passively anyway. Um, no, we stepped in at a little more structure and stability and got out of their way. And we saw the managers really flourish. So we got lucky. Is that going to happen in every location? Probably not. Um, but so far we've been really lucky that we've had good managers, good owners, and just a business that needed to be cleaned up a little bit and run like a business, not a family, you know, a family affair. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so what's, what's like the model look like? Do you have like an office that people like meet at or is it hundred percent remote going on site? Like what's the, what's it look like out there? So they're, um, they are, they are all standalone offices, uh, probably anywhere from a thousand to 1500 square feet. We've got, um, our largest location has nine like physical employees and then maybe 350 caregivers and that's Pittsburgh. Oh, wow. Lake Jackson's just two people and about a hundred, um, let's say about a hundred caregivers. Uh, Chicago is about the same. So, you know, we basically have each, each business is different. So Pittsburgh's so large that we have a dedicated person for each role. Whereas in Lake Jackson, you kind of get away with having two people do everything. Uh, but someone to answer the phones, scheduling is the hardest part. And so is staffing and home care. Staffing is really hard because, you know, especially if you have Medicaid business, the margins are low. So you're hiring people at seven to $10. You're not getting that much from Medicaid. So the margins are thin. And um, I mean, sometimes those people are, are kind of hard to get to commit to the, the job, even though that's where they work. And if someone offers them a nickel more, We'll go take the nickel more. So yeah. staffing is a recurring thing. We have the industry standard for staffing is about an 80% turnover. We're at about 60%. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's, it's constant insane. interviewing. It's and, constant recruiting. Yeah. That's uh, all we do. Are they know? 1099s? The caregivers? Uh, no, they're their employees. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's just this game, right, of, of buying an hour of time from the caregiver and reselling it at whatever, right? Yeah. That's that margin. <laughs> And, and maxing out that schedule. And that's why we like the private pay because on private pay, we can pay them a little more because um, there's more margin there. We can pay them a little more. The clients are usually wealthier and they can do a little, they can usually when they're private pay, we can get longer and more hours out of them. So, you know, Medicaid, sometimes we get three to six hour cases. And that's not really ideal. That's not worth staffing. So we'll actually, uh, you know, switch over and try to focus like our focus on acquisitions is can we get a business with 60% private pay, maybe more. Okay. Okay. What are your like fears or challenges with that? Is it, is it being remote? Is, is that a concern? Like if someone quits, what's, um, what's your plan if one of these guys quits? Uh, well, so that's the tough part. Like, and so in our Lake Jackson location, we're going to add a third person there. Uh, just in case something like that were to happen. Um, but our staff is really good. So we, we do pay them well. We do have them on a, um, a profit sharing plan now where they understand, you know, what happens when you spend this, spend that. It affects your bonus, that type of stuff. Uh, so we've okay. really gotten the employees. Actually, us being so remote has actually allowed us to get the employees more involved in the business and really take ownership of it. And I think that's part of why we instantly had uh, the growth that we did. Yeah. And you're, and you're like you said, you're, you're giving them more responsibility, letting them, I'm sure they have all these great ideas that maybe the old owner is holding them back from and, you know, your position, which is, Hey, go, go ahead and do it. Like, it sounds great as long yeah. as we're making money and we're serving the customers and doing the right thing, you know, we're open to it. Uh, so it's exciting. Yeah, it was for funny. Uh, the, the, in Pittsburgh, the, the guy who owned it, his daughter was managing the location, which initially sounds concerning. The second he stepped out of the picture, she flourished and she was so happy to have her dad out of the picture. She actually voiced that. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, don't tell him. Poor guy. Yeah, Poor guy funny. feels bad already. Yep. That's awesome. Um, so what's next? Is it continuing to grow this? You got other ventures? Like what's your future hold the next couple of years? 
So especially on the home care side, we've already gotten a mergers and acquisitions company in place to kind of help us um, begin preparing us for exit. Um, but for me, it's to dip into to really scale the title business, especially in the real estate business, which kind of feeds it organically. Um, I mean, just make acquisitions across the board. I'm not locked into any one industry, but I like to be diversified. I love learning about new businesses. Um, I think the fundamentals of every business are the same. I don't think it's that complex. I think people overthink it. I think you just need a good operator who understands it. Um, yep. What, what do you think those are? If you had to summarize like on a checklist, the fundamentals about, of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Like as far as like the, the actual operations of it, like what's, yeah. What's, like how do you simplify it down to like the same principles would apply to any business, like in, yeah. in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's so simple. It's, it really just comes down to running lean. And I think that's where a lot of these businesses go wrong. They run lean and then they run it like they run it with no exit in mind. Um, they run it like they are not, um, reporting to anybody. And so that's where you see houses and lots of lunches and meals and entertainment and all this crazy stuff on their P and L. And I look at that and just start crossing stuff off. And so when I bought the Remax franchise in Philly, um, the one I bought in April of 2020, they had about 80 agents. And when I looked at his P and L, he was showing 50 grand a year. I saw 450 grand a year because I saw, let me just layer over my stuff. And it was simple. Revenues are where they are. We're not going to change an agent's commission plan. So that's fine. Um, we're only buying the revenues. We're not buying their expenses. So everything else I can change. He had nine staff members. Now I had a similar size real estate brokerage. I ran it with one staff member. Okay. He had nine for the same size. So okay. sorry, but you're all gone. Luckily he fired them before I had to because yep. of COVID. Okay. So boom, now we got one person in there. We're instantly back to 450,000 net revenue. Um, and I think the guy had just kind of uh, gotten lazy, started to, uh, he wanted to retire, but he, he did it wrong. He set it up wrong. He started living out of the business and he had nothing he could really sell. So I think it's like, I mean, if I really had to put it down to one thing, it's run lean. That's it. Yep. Everything else can solve itself. You know, have you read uh, profit first? I don't think I have, but I did just read another book, the great game of business or something. Yep. Yeah. Pretty I read, I read that one. That one's good. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd like Profit First. Check it out. It's Mike McCowitz. Um, oh, basically, okay. he flips around and says, all right, the uh, you know the traditional profit equation is sales minus expenses equals your profit, right? right. Where that, you know, the, the true or the, what the, it should be is that sales minus your, your profit equals your expenses and that you, you set what you want to make, right? And then mm -hmm. you figure out how much sales you have like you had and you're not dramatically going to change that or, or maybe you can, but then really your focus is on the expenses and cutting out everything sure. that you can in order to hit the profit number. Um, and then he has some methods of, or some tables to say, all right, you should take this much of your, your revenue, put it towards taxes to save. So when taxes are due, you got all the money, take this amount for your profit account, take this amount then for your operations. And um, having that mindset to, to run lean, like you said, but it forces you because you're siphoning out you know, money uh, from yeah. to operate it. Versus and if I you've got all this money in there, you've got the like income creep, right? Where you feel like, you got all this money and now you can go buy the new equipment. You can go buy this where if you're starting just to divvy it up, you, it, it's a different mindset change. Sure. So. And, it, and in most businesses too, like I noticed that a lot of people try to get super creative. Um, like the real estate business is what it is. I, I don't know that it's ever changing anytime soon. And even if a large company comes in and swoops up a large portion of realtors, you're like the company's making noise now, they're still less than 10% of the national market share but they get some headlines and they'll always be that size. That's how these things work. But you see a lot of business owners get so creative or well, try to get creative and they get in their own way because then they lose sight of the fundamentals. Like, you know, what, what makes money in a real estate brokerage? Well, more realtors recruiting yeah. and, and just organically helping them grow their business. Well, how can you do that? You get them leads. So that's simple. Boom. You just increase your revenue by actually focusing on recruiting. Um, I always say people spreadsheet too much. You know, you catch them like spreadsheeting an ID and spending all this time on the perfect commission plan. And it's like the goofy stuff and figuring out like, what, how can I do a tax shelter? Well, why don't you focus on making the money first? Why don't you get the money in? Because you're yeah. not going to care about the tax shelter when you have $2 yeah. million, dollars, you know? Yep. Um, um, yeah. It's like lead and lag measures 
I don't know, have you heard of those terms where yeah. you know, your, your lead is like the actions that you can take and focus on that generate the, the business. So for, for you, it's, it's, it's probably recruiting, right? And the more agents right. you have, the more sales you're going to generate. The lag is, is the sales, right? So if you, sure. you don't have agents, you're not going to get sales. But sometimes a lot of people, we, we focus on the lag. Like what are your sales and how can I affect that instead of focus on the lead, which is we need more agents. But then the, the true lead is like, I need to do more recruiting. And for right. you to grow it, it's like how many how many outbound calls am I doing or actions taking to recruit other agents to, you know, my remaxes. Yep. And, um, but fo- focusing on the right things get you there. So cool. That's, that's great. Uh, any book recommendations? What are you reading? You mentioned the great game of business. I think that's a good one. Uh, yeah. Read many years ago. Um, tell me about that. You know what? My, um, I've bootstrapped pretty much every business that I started. Um, I love, I, I'm sure you've heard my, I think you've heard my podcast on with Pat Hyman and the, yep, and the go sure. and uh, he hammered down on my expenses because they are so low that it sounds unreal, but I spend no more than 4,500 a month uh, personally. Yep. And, uh, and I told him, I said, most of it's go abundance, but I am huge on running lean. Um, I think it's so important. And I think that, you know, one of the books that one of the books slash people that really got me started in entrepreneurship and not being afraid to just jump into things that I don't know was Grant Cardone. I know he rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but he's perfect for me. Um, and, uh, and so the 10 actual, I probably listen to that book multiple times per year and then anything by Jocko Willink. So that's just the military in me. I love hearing his voice talk about tactical stuff and blowing stuff up. So, um, but the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone, man, yep. I don't think go yep. wrong. the audiobook's great. Cause he reads it. I've, I've listened to it. I'm listening yep. to it actually as well. And it's, uh, you know, he's, he's funny. And so it's entertaining, let alone yeah. too, from, um, you know, he's right in a lot of ways. You got to take action. And if you take no action, you're not going to get the results and setting big goals rather than little goals and little results. So, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, cool. Where, where can people connect, find out more about you? It's the best source. So, I'm really bad on Instagram, but they can find me on Instagram. Uh, actually, Rod Clef just shared a show that I was on before. Okay. And I got like a ton of followers and a bunch of guys sh- sending me pictures of me in the video. I think it was like two years ago, but he <laughs> must have shared it. Um, and uh, but so that's Joseph C. McCabe okay. uh, at Joseph C. McCabe. Or they can always send me an email. Um, I guess the best one's uh, Joe McCabe mm-hmm. at btsclosings.com. That's awesome. plural. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, thanks again for coming on and sharing your story. And I think lots of good stuff about growing and, and finding the right people and, you know, giving them the the freedom to make their own decisions and, you know, get free up your time to keep doing some more cool stuff. So yeah. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Yeah, it's good cool. to come. All right. Well, I'll talk to you and you, you have a good day. All right. Thanks. See you, man. Bye.